I was in the military in the late uh, 60s, during the Vietnam era, from 67 through 70. Uh, and I was trained as an independent duty corpsman, which meant that I could actually uh, take care of soldiers independently of a doctor uh, in remote situations. Uh, and I thought I was trained to uh, take care of war trauma and uh, jungle diseases uh, and that sort of thing, because it, it was the Vietnam era, and I thought we were going to Vietnam, you know, and that's what they trained us for. So I fully expected to be facing uh, small Southeast Asian men who were gorillas in black pajamas. And instead, the military and its infinite intelligence sent me to the Antarctic, where I was looking at little guys in tuxedos. You know. <laughs> Uh, and it was, a, it was a real jarring experience uh, because that's what, what I didn't expect that in my military tour. Uh, but also it took me out of my comfort zone uh, because, uh, you know, first of all, it, there was not going to be any war trauma down there, you know. Uh, I could just barely spell frostbite and I sure didn't know how to treat it, you know, because they trained me to treat jungle rot and all those tropical things. So, uh, you know, and then but I was trained as an independent duty corpsman, so I went down there with a degree of confidence. Uh, the mission was actually, there were five men who were civilians, and I was the one military guy assigned to take care of them medically, and they were a satellite tracking team. And they were basically collecting data that was used in the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System. That, of course, here's history again, that was back before the end of the Cold War. And so we were trying to get better at dropping missiles on people and more accurate. And that's what the, the mission was about. We were down there in the Antarctic year, the same time that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And so I missed all that because we didn't have any, any TV and I didn't know about it until I got back. So that gives you an idea where it's embedded in history anyway. Uh, and where we were located geographically, I've got this uh, transparency up here and it's a little bit hard for you to see back there, but the two big large masses on the left is Africa and on the right is Australia. And we were due south of India, and the location is actually of the island we were on is actually where are we here? right here. And it's called a sub-Antarctic island. It's right here. So it's roughly 2,800 miles from uh, Africa and about 3,200 miles from Australia. Uh, we were 750 miles from Mawson, uh, which is the Australian uh, permanent Antarctic research station on the continent. Uh, we were about 250 miles north of the winter pack ice. So we didn't get the pack ice around the island, but it's called a sub-Antarctic island because we were below the Antarctic convergence uh, where the, the cold Antarctic, Antarctic waters meet uh, the Indian Ocean. So we were out in that area. The actual closest human habitation was 250 miles away at this little French outpost right here called Kerguelen. Uh, and, but it was uh, through very stormy seas. We were told when we went down to expect uh, to be there 13 months, but we could be there 16 months, depending on shipping to come and pick us up. We went in an icebreaker that dropped us off, and then it went down to the continent to resupply some of the other places. And they dropped us off. It was a seven-day trip by icebreaker from Perth, Australia, to get there. Uh, we were told that there was no possibility of evacuation, that we would be there for at least 13 months. And the reason being, there's no airport on the island. There was no human habitation. Uh, and the weather was going to be so bad during the wintertime, there was no possibility of, uh, of even sending a ship down uh, because it couldn't actually get close enough to the island to actually launch a boat to come and get us. So I was the medic for these guys who didn't know me. And when I, you know, when I packed all my medical supplies to go to the island, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Moby Dick and the, the book. I know a lot of you take literature and you've read Moby Dick. There's a character in there called Queequeg, who's actually a native uh, man. He's a whaler. Uh, and uh, on, on the ship, Queequeg starts building a coffin. And he unnerves all the other whalers because he's just busy building a coffin because he has this premonition that, you know, uh, he might die on this trip. Well, the, the uh, bird colonel that was the doctor in charge of me, I was his troop. I was his whole troop. And, but he got to stay in Washington, D.C., and I got to go down there. But he helped me plan everything. And including the radio network of doctors that I could talk to by radio and stuff like that. There were some in, in Africa, uh, some in Australia that I could talk to. But he had me take something that I didn't plan on taking. He told me I should take a coffin with me. 
Uh, and I was kind of unnerved by it. And that was in the era, for those of you that are old enough to remember, when every week on TV we saw our soldiers coming back in aluminum coffins with flags draped over them. And so I ended up taking one of those aluminum coffins down there. And I packed it completely full of all my medical supplies because it floats, just like Queequeg and, uh, and Moby Dick. His coffin floated. Uh, but it didn't inspire much confidence in my crew when I got there. <laughs> they said, hey, Doc, you brought a coffin? You know, uh, do you work at a mortuary or are you actually a medic? You know, and it was like, it was one of those things. So, but nonetheless, that gives you an idea about how serious this was. They, we had to expect the idea that we might not all of us come back. That's how remote this was and that's how, that's how, uh, how brutal it was. So uh, that just gives you an idea where it's located. Uh, I'm gonna show you a very quick little five minute video. Uh, here's, here's the actual topography of the island. And the little blue circle is where our camp was. The island is dominated by a dormant volcano that has year-round glaciers on it. Uh, and it's totally uninhabited. Uh, historically, it was discovered in 1833 uh, by a whaling vessel, a British whaling vessel. Uh, and from 1833 until uh, the turn of the century, uh, they did a lot of whaling and sealing down there. They pretty much almost uh, made the fur seals extinct on that island. And the fur seals hid in a couple of places off the island where they couldn't beach the boats in the olden days. Um, but uh, there are all kinds of flora and fauna down there. Uh, the only thing not down there was human beings. But humans occupied that over the years in various ways. Uh, from 1954 to about 59 or so, about, no, actually, no, actually it was uh, just the, like 49 to 54, I'm sorry. Uh, the Australians occupied, this is their territory, and they occupied it to train their Antarctic explorers to go down to the continent, that, to train their dog teams, train them how to work on glaciers and how to survive in really inclement weather. Uh, and then they abandoned the camp, and then we showed up there. They abandoned it in 1954, and we showed up in 1969. So that gives you an idea, and you know, no humans in between. What I'm gonna show you very quickly uh, is a little video uh, my dad captured this. Uh, it's Sir Edmund Hillary actually sponsored uh, an expedition that involved Heard Island, and they dropped off a crew of people in the mid-80s to climb this mountain. It's a 9,000-foot mountain. It had only been climbed once before. And then uh, they, they went by sailboat, big, uh, big sailboat. They dropped off a crew to climb the mountain and a radio team to actually uh, make contact with people in the rest of the world because they like to, you know, ham radio operators like to you know, uh, you know, have contact with strange places. And so they dropped off a radio team and a mountain climbing team and a science team. And then the, the rest of the crew went down to the Antarctic and did some other stuff. So I'm gonna show you about five minutes of that video, just enough uh, so you can get a feel for what it was like. And then I'm gonna talk mostly, uh, one of the things we had all kinds of seals and birds and I mean, incredible flora and fauna down there, very exotic. But by far and away, the most interesting animal on the island was the humans and how we, how we handled that isolation. And that's what I'm going to talk with primarily is about uh, the humans and how we can understand humans and how they behave in isolated duty. But I'd like you to get a feel for what that place was like. It's one thing to see a transparency and see. I've got a bunch of slides that uh, I'm going to ask uh, just be shown. I'm not going to talk about them because I don't want this to be a travel log. But the slides are just gonna be shown in the background, about three every minute. I've got a few slides. And once again, this is history because we were down there at a time when there were no video cameras. You know, so everything we did was with slide, you know, with 35 millimeter cameras. We didn't even have digital cameras. It was, it was that long ago. So anyway, let me turn this off and I'll, I'll show you this video. I'm sorry about the size of the screen, but at least I think you'll get a chance to see what this looks like. One day after leaving the Australian coast, the first land of Journey's End is sighted, the Macdonald Islands, reputed to have the biggest penguin colony in the world. The smell of the guano reaches the ship three miles offshore. 
It's very much how I expected. We're howling gale, big cream is coming over the deck. It looks very forbidding, but it's great to be here. There's sort of a uh, terrific beauty oh, yeah. about it. Uh, very awe-inspiring. It was these islands where a landing is almost impossible that provided refuge during the years of sealing for enough of the Heard Island wildlife to save it from extinction. Finally, that same afternoon, Anaconda 2 runs the headland of the Lawrence Peninsula and enters the Heard Island anchorage at Atlas Cove. It's certainly a very frightening, awe-inspiring looking place with glaciers hanging down off all the mountains around us and willy wars just screaming down. We're getting 50 knots of wind across the deck here. A very frightening place, but a very beautiful place at the same time. Well, when you get there and the, the mountain uh, hopefully looms up uh, with, the, uh, with not too much cloud round about it, it's a very exciting moment indeed, because now you have to get to grips with the uh, technical problems, the, the dangerous problems perhaps, of getting ashore on the island, of getting yourself established, of getting a base camp uh, that will withstand uh, very severe storms, and then ultimately, of course, uh, the final uh, push towards the summit of the mountain, hopefully with suitable weather, so you can find your way up and find your way down again. No time is wasted beginning the task of getting part of the expedition ashore. The weather is calm for the moment and the work moves ahead quickly. Atlas Cove is the nearest thing to a natural harbour at Heard Island. But despite the shelter of the hills, it can quickly become a treacherous piece of water when the storms sweep in. It's here among the ruins of the old Antarctic research station that the expedition plans to establish the first of its two bases. The main function of the Atlas Cove base is to be the radio operation, a non-stop program of worldwide contact to be carried out by the two-man radio amateur team, Dave Shaw and Al Fisher. In addition, some of the expedition's scientific programs can begin here. The second base will be established later, 15 miles further down the coast, where it's hoped access to the mountain will be better. For the moment, home is this still weatherproof module whose only shortcoming is lack of shelter around the front door. With no shortage of building materials, the home extension experts are soon on the job. Perhaps the oldest building on the island that has survived intact is also regarded by many as the most important, even if it is a long walk on a cold night to enjoy one of the comforts of civilization. With warmth and shelter established, the number one priority now is to get Heard Island on the air. Because the island is remote enough to be regarded in radio terms as an individual country, and because there has been no permanent habitation since 1954, Heard is now the number one desirable contact destination for thousands of radio amateurs around the world. So, what started as a need by the expedition for the safety of a good radio facility has now blossomed into a full-scale operation. As work goes on, most of the locals remain undisturbed. Only a few acknowledge the presence of intruders. There are, however, some who definitely don't like the idea. Cameras, in particular, cause the skewer birds to form an attack squadron. Ooh, didn't like that. 
actually tampering with a penguin, no matter how well-intentioned, produces an outburst of indignation. Right, he's done. Right, off you go. Two he clubs. Oh. Oh. Hey, hey. Oh. Just as when he got those overalls. Bye-bye. Oh. <laughs> Wasn't too bad, was it, fella? Hey? I think you have some idea now how, how remote this was. Uh, there, there's, a whole there's a whole body of uh, research and a whole body of knowledge that would have helped us had we known anything about it, but we didn't. You know, I was a medic. I had no prior knowledge. I had two years of college, basically had my AA degree. I thought I wanted to be a doctor, uh, and so I went in the Army, and uh, I got my medical training and stuff like that, which contributed. I, actually, I, uh, I got a good enough training that I was able to translate it into my RN when I got out of uh, the military. And I went on and got my degree in psychology, uh, uh, both my bachelor's and my master's in psychology, as a direct result of these experiences. It totally changed my, uh, my life direction. And, and the reason it did is I, I went there totally unprepared for how this kind of duty affects human beings. Uh, and, and I've spent most of my life in some ways uh, you know, responding to the challenges and the opportunities that were presented by this particular experience. Uh, sadly, uh, I had no preparation going down. I got all my uh, answers when I got back. I had lots of questions and very few answers. Uh, and I got a chance to meet with a social psychologist when I came back from the Antarctic after being down there for a year, whose job it was to study men and their behavior in isolated duty. You know, and I'm sitting there giving my post-mission uh, debriefing and talking about all the problems we had. And he's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, we see that all the time. And I'm going, what? <laughs> you knew about this and nobody told us? He said, nobody asked. You know, they were satellite scientists. They were, they were physicists and geodesists and mathematicians and computer specialists, and I was a medic. I didn't know anything about psychology. You know, uh, I knew a little bit about combat fatigue and stuff like that, but that's all I knew. So anyway, we had, we had a bunch of problems. Uh, you know, First of all, the one thing to just sort of touch on for those of you who are taking cultural anthro in here, so you, you know, get your extra credit and stuff like that. Uh, you know, uh, it, as you'll recall, uh, and I, I'm not going to go to my definitions here, but basically culture is this whole set of, of ideas and beliefs that we're raised with. Uh, and those ideas and beliefs get translated into our habitual behaviors and kind of the way we relate to our environment and the, and the way that we relate to each other. You know, uh, and, 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 it, and our culture guides us, doesn't it? It sort of gives us a set of, it gives us some structure, you know, both internal structure in terms of our ideas and beliefs, but it also gives us external structure, too, in terms of the institutions that support the culture, like schools, like this school, uh, you know, uh, like churches and government buildings and things like that. So, you know, and we don't really understand how, I, I, I'm, I have to take that back. Some of you in here who have come from other cultures uh, to the United States understand a little bit about this. When you change cultures, uh, when you change a place that operates on familiar ideas and beliefs and has familiar institutions and you go to a new place, you suffer something called cultural stress because everything's different. And some people even suffer something called culture shock. The difference is so great and it's so difficult for them to adjust to that they actually have mental and emotional problems. Uh, as, a, as a consequence of the changes. So most of us who are embedded in a culture uh, and, and live in it every day don't have any appreciation for how much it supports us and guides us and contributes to our comfort level uh, and also contributes to us being uh, less stressed. And we certainly didn't appreciate that. You know, we went down to the Antarctic. They just, they packed six of us up and dropped us off with a whole bunch of supplies and basically said, you're gonna take care of yourself for over a year. You're going to do absolutely everything for yourself. We were a totally self-sustaining community. We had to take care of our own food, power, uh, water, uh, sanitation, uh, medical needs, and everything, all six of us. So all those things that you depend on in society that other people do for you, we had to do for ourselves. It wasn't just a matter of uh, wash the car, mow the lawn, and take out the garbage, which a lot of us have trouble doing, right? <laughs> When you have enough trouble finding time in your day to do that kind of stuff, right? So we had a scientific mission, plus we had to take care of all that other stuff. And we didn't go down there, we knew we had to do it intellectually, but we didn't go down understanding what kind of demands that was going to place on us. And then the other thing that happened is it took away all of the structure. 
that we're used to. We carried some of our internal culture with us, our ideas and our beliefs. I mean, certainly we took our, our value system with us. Uh, we, you know, we took our religious beliefs with us. There were no churches there, no church bells, but people still read the Bible. So they still practice some aspects of their faith and stuff like that. So we, uh, the other aspects of culture that we took with us, uh, they were in government service, they were scientists. Uh, they, they took the scientific tradition with them. I took the military tradition with me, my sense of duty, my sense of honor. Uh, and so we all took those things from our vocation and from our, from our training uh, along with us, both internally and externally. Uh, but what we weren't prepared for is everything that got taken away that supported us. The absence of all the, just the everyday expected uh, institutions and the familiar sites and, and things like that was just all gone. Uh, you know, for me, I'm an outdoorsman. I love the Sierra Nevadas. I spend as much time as I can backpacking up there and stuff like that. There was not a single tree on that island. And I suffered from that. No trees. You know, and I, you know, it's like everywhere I look, no trees. You know, and it's just a small thing, you know, to you guys maybe, but to me it was kind of a big deal. You know, uh, and you know, there were, there's just a lot missing. Uh, we were missing society. Our entire society was gone. The new society was six of us, uh, and, and, and we didn't even have a plan for how our society was going to evolve. Uh, it, it evolved in, in kind of a natural social psychological way, which it turns out was quite understandable uh, if I had talked to a social psychologist before we went down, but it was quite confusing to all of us uh, as, we, as we went through it. Uh, you know, we, we entered a culture when we went down there that was quite interesting too. It was the culture of explorers and adventurers. Uh, and, we, and the culture we joined, we didn't join them directly, but we joined them by radio. There were Antarctic explorers all over that, uh, that hemisphere and down in, in the Antarctic region that we could talk to by radio. And, uh, they, and we took books about Antarctic exploration. And so we had joined this new culture of explorers and these hardy people that, that wintered over in very uh, severe climates. And we learned lots of stuff about how to manage yourself in, under those kinds of conditions. We talked to people on the radio all the time. Uh, they, the, like a lot of the hardy seafarers and explorers of, of centuries before, they'd adopted some of those things. Like, for example, you know, the British seamen that were out in the, on the ships for, for, for months and months at a time developed this habit, what they called the rum ration. You know, that once every day in the evening when everybody was getting ready to go down below to sit in their little hammocks and be in that really close quarters and survive all night while a few guys were on watch, uh, the quartermaster would give out a rum ration. And basically what they were doing was self-medicating so they could handle the stress of being below deck, you know, and they'd all relax and then the next morning they could get up and take over again. Well, the rum ration was a part of the culture in the Antarctic, which I didn't understand. When I was going down on the icebreaker, uh, the doctor on board the icebreaking ship said to me, how much booze are you taking? And I said, well, we've all got a few bottles and some of the guys are taking some 12 packs. And he said, ain't going to last. And we said, well, wait a minute, we're not all, nobody's an alcoholic. And he said, it just simply won't last. Uh, you need more. And I said, but he, and he said, think of it as medicine. And he reminded me about the rum ration thing. And he said, here, I'm going to give you some alcohol to take down there. He gave me a five-gallon can of ethanol alcohol, 198 proof. If you, if you cut it in half, that was 10 gallons of pure grain alcohol. And he said, I don't know if this is going to be enough, but that's all I can spare. <laughs> and, and he said, and you should, have, uh, you should have a rum ration every day. You know? And we entered this, uh, this culture of people who had developed all these habits and these ways of thinking and behaving to survive isolated duty. They partied every time they turned around. I mean, if you had a birthday, they partied. Uh, the biggest party of the, you know, of the winter was the midwinter celebration, you know, June 22nd. Uh, the, uh, actually, up here, it's what, the, the summer equinox? Isn't that, or summer solstice. Yeah, down there, that's the shortest day of the year. You know, and so there's this giant party. And they actually had, at, uh, at Little America, uh, they actually have a race uh, in the mid at midwinter celebration. And that race is, is televised, or not televised, but it's sent out on the radio all over the Antarctic continent. And everybody bets on the race. And I mean, and it's a handicap race. So some people are riding these motorcycles with studs in the tires. Other people are riding snowmobiles. Uh, the doctor down there was pushing a 55-gallon drum half filled with diesel fuel. 
you know, and some, you know, and so everybody got a different handicap, and we all bet on the race. And the, the deal was you could collect on your bet once you got back to civilization. So there was all this culture that we got immersed in, but it still wasn't enough because it was out there someplace. You know, and so what we got hit with was, uh, you know, the stress of not having, uh, you know, thoughts and beliefs and behaviors that fit our circumstances because the structure was all taken away. Uh, and we ended up facing a lot of stress. Uh, it, it was variable. Uh, you know, it, in some ways it was kind of like these soap operas that people watch on TV. The group dynamics shifted all the time. You know, there'd always be somebody that was kind of the odd man out that everybody else was mad at, or there'd be these little cliques of people that were mad at each other uh, based on whatever the issues were at the time. Maybe he didn't take care of the generator well enough, or maybe he didn't handle the water system well enough, or maybe the cook cooked a bad meal, or you know, whatever the issues were. You know, people got cranky and people were hard on each other. And there were these shifting alliances. It got so bad that we created something in our own culture. We called it the Penguin Hilton. People would get so stressed out with each other. Imagine this. We're, you saw how far we are from many human beings. And imagine uh, the fact that we thought we needed a vacation from each other. So I built a cabin on the coast uh, two miles from our main uh, encampment where people could go when they were so stressed out they needed to get away for a break. You know? And we had people use it on a fairly regular basis. It's like, the heck with you guys. I'm getting out of here. You guys are getting on my nerves. And so that person would go stay in the cabin for a few days. Uh, we developed all kinds of sayings. We developed a real sick sense of humor that, you know, that had all these sort of you know, uh, standard, ways, standard ways of notation that we would talk, you know, sort of abbreviated notation, much like what married couples do. You know, where you've had experiences enough together that you don't have to say the whole thing, you can just use a couple of words here and there uh, and stuff like that. Um, we, we did a lot, of, a lot of stuff like that. What happened to us though, and I, I want to allow some time for questions, but let me just review the kinds of things that happened to us and then, then I'll just answer your questions. Uh, we ended up, uh, the kinds of problems that I saw, uh, a lot of us struggled with depression which manifested in various ways. Uh, the sunlight down there was very limited. We weren't all the way at the Antarctic Circle, but we had very short periods of sunlight. Uh, these pictures that you're watching behind me, uh, we took those, that was part of our culture. We called them clear day celebrations. Whenever it was clear, which is very rare, we'd run out with our cameras and just shoot pictures like crazy. And these are just the result of the few clear days we had. It was not that clear down there. Most of the time, the wind was blowing anywhere from 40 to 50 miles an hour. We had whiteouts, uh, rain, sleet, snow, uh, very inclement. You couldn't get outside hardly at all. So whenever we had a clear day, it was like uh, kids getting out of school, running around, just doing all kinds of stuff. You know, um, but so one of the things we suffered with was depression. You know, some people slept too much. Some people didn't sleep at all. Uh, they were up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, and stuff like that. We, uh, some people suffered with anxiety. Uh, loneliness was a real big issue and uh, how we handle loneliness. And each of us had our own psychological strategies. Um, we, it turned out we had a man that was unbeknownst to us, the cook, was actually an alcoholic. And his alcoholism got much worse. Uh, and we ended up uh, becoming somewhat... For those of you that are in the human services program or in our psych tech program, you study the dysfunctional family. In some ways, we became his dysfunctional family. He helped us all become part of his family. One of the members became a codependent enabler, and, and the rest of us were like the troublemaker and the mascot, and all those different things that you see in a dysfunctional family with respect to him. We had, um, you know, we had people who would malinger that just the stress and the responsibility they would just sort of pretend that they were sick when they weren't, and I was the medic, and they'd come to me because they were, quote, suffering and they couldn't do their job, you know, and I knew they weren't, but, you know, it's sort of like time for holiday. Uh, we, we had a, uh, a man that actually developed uh, an actual uh, autoimmune, it's an allergic, a stress-related autoimmune disorder uh, that looked very much like, for the nurses in the room and the people that understand this, it looked like anaphylaxis, like an anaphylactic shock reaction to antibiotics and he almost died on me. And I ended up, I didn't recognize what was happening, but I treated him, I was trained as a medic to treat shock and to treat anaphylactic shock, so I treated him just like that. Uh, and you know, uh, luckily for me, and, and I, caught, I finally got a hold of one of the doctors, it took about 48 hours to get a hold of him because the, the weather was real bad and the radio conditions were real sketchy. 
but when I got a hold of them, they said, yep, you're doing the right thing. Nope, we don't know what's causing it. Because there were no insects down there, no foods. I had not given him any antibiotics. When we got back and I did the debriefing at the Surgeon General's office, one of the doctors said, does he have angioneurotic edema in his family? And I said, what? What's that? And he said, it's a tension allergic reaction to your own body that can actually be fatal. And it turned out his mom had it. You know? And so the stress, he was the chief of party. He was the guy in charge of the whole thing. The stress of being in charge of this whole mission caused this man to collapse and almost die. Uh, we had another man who actually had a personality disorder, now I know, because I've studied all this stuff for years, but at the time he had a personality disorder and probably should never have gone to the Antarctic, but he was our computer specialist. Uh, and, you know, they needed him desperately. Uh, he, was, uh, he was somewhat of a, he's a schizoid personality disordered person, uh, but this, he had never been in isolated duty like this before but he was the primo guy for this assignment, and nobody bothered to do any psychological screening on him. Uh, and he became psychotic and actually uh, hallucinated. Uh, he had paranoid delusions, uh, and he actually got very involved in violence toward the seals. He would, about once every three or four weeks, he'd get so agitated that he'd go out and bludgeon a seal to death with like a two by four uh, and stuff like that. Um, you know, and. You know, we foolishly, I, I consulted with the doctors I could call at Northwest Cape, Australia, and I never got a chance to talk to a psychiatrist. These were just medical doctors in the Navy. I uh, just said, well, you know, there are lots of SEALs down there. Uh, just, you know, hide the guns, make sure the cook locks up the knives, and somebody needs to stay up 24 hours a day. So we put on a watch. We, the, the other five of us had to stay up 24 hours a day around the clock just to keep an eye on this guy. Uh, and he never did get aggressive toward any of the humans, uh, but it was always toward the seals, and uh, I, he probably killed somewhere around 18 seals while he was down there in a very violent way. Uh, you know, uh, when I got back, of course, and I started studying psychology, and I started realizing that what we did was uh, not good. We actually helped him habituate to violence, and it would have been very easy for him to turn to humans because he wasn't going to be, uh, the violence toward the seals wouldn't satisfy his impulses toward violence. And I didn't figure that out, of course, until I was working on my master's degree. And I, I, I really got interested. My master's degree is in the assessment and prediction of violence in psychiatric patients. So can you see how this affected me? You know? uh, and then the other, the last thing, and then I'll, I'll stop for questions, is we actually developed a group psychosis while we were down there. Uh, we developed a group delusional disorder, which is actually in the DSM-4. You know, they call them shared delusional disorders, but it was our entire group. Uh, they asked us uh, by radio toward the end, they said, would you guys be willing to stay for an extra couple of months? And we all said, no, we want to go home. <laughs> and they said, oh, it's going to be really expensive to send another team down there to take, just take over for a couple of months. Why don't you guys stay? And we said, no, our contract was after 13 months we get to go home. And so we all said no. Uh, and, you know, and then about that time when they were doing that, uh, we started having sketchy radio communications and we couldn't get through to people and our lifeline was radios and there'd be, there'd be weeks at a time where we couldn't get through. We thought they heard us, they were just ignoring us because we gave them the wrong answer that we didn't want to stay. So our radio relay stations, it was like they were ignoring us and we started believing that and then at one point on Armed Forces Radio, which we listened to all the time, that was the time when uh, China and Russia were lined up along the, uh, the Mongolian border and they were shooting at each other with artillery and tanks. And we heard that on the radio and then all of a sudden absolute radio silence for the next four weeks. We didn't hear anything. We became convinced that nuclear Armageddon had happened while we were down in the Antarctic. It was kind of like that, that Australian movie on the beach. You know? Uh, and we were just convinced that Armageddon had happened and we were the last sole surviving members of the human race on Hurt Island. And we're looking around thinking, who can build a boat? You know, it's like, how are we gonna get out of here? You know, and I mean, it was, we actually were delusional about it. We had all of the feelings, we had all the behaviors and everything else. And imagine our relief when uh, they, they finally came up on the radio and said, and we said, where were you guys? And they said, well, didn't you know that we had sunspots for the last four weeks? That's one other thing they didn't tell us before we went down. You know, is that while we were down there, there was going to be a period of very high sunspot activity, which breaks up the ionosphere and doesn't let radio waves skip around the curvature of the Earth. So that when they were sending radio waves or when we were sending them, they were just shooting out into space. They weren't going around the curvature of the Earth. 
So we were out of touch and they knew it. They knew that there was gonna be that downtime of about four weeks during that period of time, but nobody told us about it. So we were paranoid and delusional for four weeks until we had radio contact again. So I'll stop right there and then see if you guys have any questions for me. I, I'm really skimming through a lot here, but just to kind of, I'm trying to give you an idea of the psychology, the culture, uh, the sociology in a way, and a lot of those things that you guys are all studying.